Hello everybody, welcome to another edition of Revival Cast. This is our seventh episode, lucky number seven. We have made it this far and as you can see, uh, Astral has not made it this far. No, I'm just kidding. He's just gone for this week. He has some company coming over, but we have, as always, a great group of casts anyway um, with Diggs, Cessera, and Sailkite. So I'm going to pass it over to Cessera and she can kind of let you know about what this episode's going to be about and I'll get everything else set up. All right, well, this episode is a special one because we're going to do not just one hour, but two, um, because we couldn't do last week given the holiday and whatnot, so, you know, we want to catch up on everything, so we're going to do two hours, um, we're going to talk about the developer blog number 21 and 22, as well as some stuff going on in the community. And of course, our uh, book club of the week. And we'll be doing some Q and A's and stuff. So if you have any questions or things you want to hear us talk about, go ahead and post in Twitch chat. And we'll be looking at that like we always try to do. Um, so I guess let's just start with um, the developer blog number 21. Uh, and, you know, that one focuses on culture and religion, and what do we think about it? I immediately, I mean, you know, after I read through it the first time, I love what they're doing with, like, having, especially in the most recent descriptions, I don't know if anybody listened to that podcast, we'll talk a little bit about that later, that uh, Ambo did, but just, there's so much depth in the description of the cultures, and they're really, I like the r wide variety, because, you know, knowing that this is going to be a game that's just all human, um, it's something that, you know, it's going to be really important to make sure everybody feels like, you know, they can be different in some way and that the world feels really different because, you know, people that are used to the really high fantasy, which is pretty much the popular thing in MMOs these days, you know, it would be pretty shocking mundaneness to be just all human and, you know, have a really um, not too much diversity between these different human cultures. So I liked what they've said so far. I'm really interested to see, um, you know, once, e even not uh, the in-game shots of different architecture and stuff they'll be developing later, which is probably a lot further down the road. Um, but it'd be awesome, you know, hopefully in the next several months to get some concept art for these other locations and cities. But right now they're playing the very smart move of um, keeping it small, you know, focusing on Crown's Rock, getting this part going and, you know, building out from there instead of trying to make a massive you know, a massive world and have it be hollow and empty, which is, you know, probably what a lot of people have experienced in some of these recent MMOs that have launched. So to me, that was just a good sign to see uh, a lot of diversity there between the human cultures so far. Yeah, about uh, diversity and culture, and uh, I... Uh, I was a localization manager, especially for Activision, and um, my second language is Spanish, my third is Japanese, my fourth is Russian, um, so uh, anytime we can get more culture, even if it's just within a human population, that's, that's, uh, that's great, I was really excited. And, you know, religions uh, that were getting fairly distinct religions, even within Crown's Rock, that was very interesting to read. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm really impressed uh, how, <laughs> for one, this early in, in development, we can sort of get uh, such a vivid sense for just how very um, uh, potentially different some of these cultures are going to be. I mean, obviously, the big one from the blog was the comparison uh, between sort of the Kongorai and Akatha um, side of things and uh, Skypass. Right, and and I actually, the more I read over the blog, the more I th I was thinking beyond just sort of an Egyptian thing, in um, in Kongorai to almost a uh, sort of a um, Iran or Turkish uh, sort of like mountain. I don't know the the term for this biome, but like that sort of thing. In addition to just sort of like the high the high desert plains thing that. Um, obviously is where the city is situated but i mean it's it's just there's so much implication um for for the imagination beyond just what's actually 
you know, there and, and, and concrete so far. And it's really got me excited to just think about what sort of things are going to surprise us coming out of the woodwork. For those asking me to say something in Russian, uh, I was actually in, uh, I performed uh, the musical Hair in Moscow in Russian. Um, so that's how I learned Russian, by the way. But um, yeah, uh, the um, interesting part for me is the various religions. Um, and I'm really stoked that we, we, we might be able to get uh, fashion sets in, uh, in Sky Pass that have fur and, you know, we could actually have costumes that um, represent the biomes. Uh, that's one of the things that I feel is kind of missing in most games. We get these uh, really elaborate armor sets, but we rarely get things that actually fit the biomes that we're in. So that is one of the things that I'm looking forward to with Revival. And that ties into a lot to something we haven't talked about in a while with, you know, having that the different armor you're wearing and stuff totally matter to, towards the climate. You know, if you're in the cold and you're, you know, not wearing the right stuff, you're going to freeze your butt off. If you're in the desert, you're going to overheat. So I think it's really cool that, you know, that's going to be more than just aesthetic. You know, it's going to be actual mechanically, um, have a mechanical impact. So I'm excited about that. And I, I too love, you know, I'm not, I hate actually having, you know, I'm going to use a moment to, to hate on hate on the WoW armors. I hate having like the giant bulky shoulder pads. I wish there was other options. Um, I hate a lot of those types of things and being always all armor. I like the idea of, you know, not having armor. Uh, just, you know, as a rogue type, it just makes sense to not be covered in like plate looking armor. <laughs> so. Yeah, all that's very interesting. I like, um, how we're going to, well, I believe we're going to be able to tell where people have come from based on the way they look, um, and it's not just going to be something that's in the lore. Uh, and Diggs, you mentioned how uh, it's interesting that they've included multiple religions in Crowns Rock, and I agree with that. I think it's very cool that almost the basis of Crowns Rock existence is because of some religious conflict. Uh, the blog says the primary culture of Crowns Rock was established by the interplay between the two religious orders that drove immigration to the rock and the workers that immigrated there. Um, and that, I mean, that's some really good writing. So congrats to the team. I mean, that's how the real world works. That's how history works. And I think that in a lot of stories and games, you know, that's forgotten. It's just oh, this is, a, this is a pretty place, this is what it looks like, these are the people who are there, when there's no real reason for them to be there. And so they've clearly thought this through. So nice, nice job on that. <laughs> I love, too, that they, you know, Crown's Rock is so small. I, I love the fact that they have this dynamic where, you know, all these different social um, and organizational entities are going to be, you know, at odds at different things. But they're, you know, in such a compact area and they've got to live on top of each other you know in so many ways and that they actually have to be forced to cooperate to some extent so I kinda like that you know dynamic it adds an instant level of complexity to you know you can't just hate an opposing faction because you're gonna see them you know every day you can't it's not the guy on the other side of the continent you know there's no zone boundary lines where you have friendly territory and not it's gonna be immediately in your face you know you're gonna have to make decisions right away that are gonna you know some people are like and some people are immediately gonna dislike and you're not gonna get to you know, sh shoo your way around to always being on everybody's good side, um, to, you know, necessarily. Maybe there are ways that you can do that, but um, I think it's going to be, you know, really complex out of the gate just because of that, you know, tight-packed uh, element of Crown's Rock. Yeah, I saw uh, an interesting um, thread on the forums about uh, PvP. Um, it might have been the PvE versus PvE thread, but um, one of the things that someone was talking about um, was um, they really want this PvP and they want to be able to kill people when they want to be able to kill people. Um, and I'm normally, well, I'm a PvP sometimes person, so I don't like it to be 24-7, you know, when I don't want to have combat with other players 
I, if I'm not in the mood, I don't want to be forced into it. Um, but uh, again, one of the fun parts about um, about revival is that there's other stuff to do while you're dead. So being dead isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but uh, the other cool thing is we know where people live. <laughs> so not only yeah. can we go track them down if they kill us or whatever, we can go find out where they live while they're offline and do stuff to them that way. So that's the other kind of cool thing about how the whole thing is set up. You know, we can get to your houses. <laughs> it's not awesome. Man, someone exactly egged my house. Why? I have a secret uh, tenement that's not on the thread, except now it won't be that secret. But yeah, I mean... That's uh, that's the risk that all the founders right now are having when we're talking about our lovely manses and all of our plans that we want to yeah. do with them. Hey guys, where do you live? Let's put it in a thread. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure there will be somebody out there compiling that, like Blackwell Crowns Rock. Here's where everybody lives. If this person kills you, it. yep, it's we, we have it already. So yep. it's gonna um, be interesting. Yeah, the other thing though, I. I wish we'd gotten a little bit more info on uh, Nodens and Animae. Like, I know um, that they're major religions, and I know Animae is over um, life, well, death, really, over death. Um, but I would love to have a little bit more info on, I don't know, how that might play out. I, I, I have a very good idea, I think, about Brog. Um, and why I would want to join that religion or how I would be, want to be involved with that religion, but I'm not exactly sure how I would be involved in the religion for Anamai, other than, you know, if, if you die, maybe stay dead to make her happy. I don't know. Uh, don't, don't, don't reanimate people. Um, but if I were going to worship her day a day, what would that look like? If I were going to do that with Nodens, what would that look like? The other interesting thing is when you look around the uh, street names in the areas, there's also uh, Hoenn. Uh, there's like Hoenn's Gate, um, and there's an area devoted to that. So I'm wondering how Hoenn plays into Crown Rock as well in terms oh, of worship. Oh, yeah, man. Have I got fun things for you, Diggs? So, so yeah. So on the map, there are uh, there's Hoenn's Gate, um, which is I believe in the north section. I want to say um, there is a street called Hedrastrat. I have no idea how to pronounce it, but H A E D R A S T R A A T, and it is um, also a reference. Well, that's that's a reference to a great old one, um, Hedra Hydra. Um, there are there's obviously Bastet's Rest um, and the various streets pertaining to uh, uh, Basque slash Bastet. There is I think one or two Noden street names around the cathedral for Night Gods, um, and all sorts of fun stuff. Oh yeah, oh yeah, religion is everywhere on this island. It's great, and uh, but yeah, so Hoenn. I will tell you um, the secret secret things about Hoenn that I've observed based on reading um, in uh, both IRC and in the forums. Uh, Hoenn is so far basically um, the non. And did he cut out for everyone else or just me? Yeah, he froze. <laughs> right, uh... right before the secret. Oh, yeah. perfect time. <laughs> so see, intervention. It yeah, not yep. happening. that's like, yep. no, this is my secret. That's showing you oh, guys. You have to get you know buy in, get into the IRC, and check it out for yourself. So, yeah. Yes, we have secrets. Lots of secrets. So one of the other cool things about um, what I read on the blog uh, between Khan Gorai and Sky Pass and Crowns Rock. Um, Crowns Rock is you know fairly gray since that's where we start off but um it seems like con garai is going to be more red and sky pass is going to be more blue um just because it, it it seemed to be saying that that uh con garai is run by corrupt government and sky pass is run by monks i think it's going to be harder to uh to uh pvp indiscriminately in in um Sky Pass than it will be in Kongarai. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I I think that it's going to be more of that early red city. You know, I, I think I've heard the de developers say several times, you know, we want to have at all times, you know, like a blue, a real blue and a real red type, you know, contrast in, hey, everything's orderly here, everything's lolly, lolly everything over here is lawless and chaotic and, you know, the wild west of, of revival. So I'm interested to see, you know, that one with some of the more questionable deities that and cults that are allowed to exist there openly and you know a lot of this more tyrannical type you know rule by might rule by influence and power um, being that you know which you know there's no no reason to say that can't also be like a blue scenario you know when you're in a lolly thing but it seems like it is being set up to kind of be that first red you know that red karmic dark you know wild west I guess of revival And sale, well, you got sale. Oh, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. Now that you're back, uh, <laughs> you've left everyone hanging. We're not really sure what happened. Maybe some divine intervention, Illuminati stuff going on. I don't know. Um, yeah. So it looks like uh, Morikov is trying to block my um, block my dissemination of Hohen's uh, Hohen's mystery here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so Hoenn is basically like um, the find a way god, if you will, for for regular people. Um, in in juxtaposition to sort of the the classic Yogg-Sothoth that um, that people have in uh, in terms of being you know Yogg-Sothoth as the gate and the key kind of thing. So if you're having trouble uh, finding you know a political contact or um, you know if you're if you're at an impasse trying to accomplish some goal um, then perhaps uh, you may want to invest some uh, some you know uh, tribute to uh, to Hoenn to try to find a way through that so for instance if uh, you're trying to tell a secret and you are stopped halfway through you should pay some sort of tribute in order to uh, come back from the internet dead and and convey your secret, I, I see how that works. Yeah, you uh, you missed it, but I um I actually uh, forged impromptu like a little um, a little lock and key, and it's sitting over here on the desk um, as a as a tribute uh, to uh, dear Helen. <laughs> well, we know what religion you're part of now. Uh, I, so I guess. To get back on topic, well, we're on topic, uh, but what maybe, you know, a lot of us are role players, we have some characters in mind, did this vlog make us think differently about what characters we want to play, or maybe, you know, Diggs you were talking about, uh, how you would, your character might want to be a part of a certain religion, and if you have to find out more information about that, I'm just curious if that's changed anyone's minds. It changes my mind all the time, and the way it changes my mind is it just adds to the number of alts I need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the more you see, I'm gonna have a huge harem or you know bulk of of, of alts. I mean, nice for me. It didn't. It didn't. I I have a very very specific character in mind that I. Am, am not going to be talking about because of, he's just that type of character right now so um, but yeah it didn't change my mind yet I think there are things that will change my character a lot especially when you know more talk about ships comes up more talk about um, s sabotage and things like that come up those things might adjust how I uh, do my character a little bit so but yeah that's a little sneak peek into what I'm planning to be there I just want to be all over the world now. I wanna, I wanna be in Crowns Rock to start because it's gonna be, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of happenings and goings on. But Sky Pass sounds so alluring for just being able to like dive into knowledge and lore and all sorts of, you know, uh, fantastic things. And then there's Kongorai, which has reasons that uh, are related to what I want to do with my character, but aren't necessarily, you know. Uh, things I want to say out loud for fear of being, uh, you know, immediately shut down by <laughs> by some antagonist. But, uh, but yeah, I want to be everywhere in the world, and there's no way to do it. 
Well, and I'll say too, so um, I think I have a character, it might even be my main character, that um, is interested in following Brog. So one of the changes um, that's occurred based on this uh, blog is that I've been expecting to stay in Crown's Rock for the most part because there seems to be like a lot of stuff to do in Crown's Rock. Um, but the cool thing is that there's a different, or the the the, the, um, the way the monks in in Sky Pass worship Brog might be significantly different than the way the monks in Crown's Rock worship Brog, and I'd love to check that out. I mean, that's we almost never see that to have one religion that worships in different ways in the same game. That's that's amazing. Yeah, that's I got. I got. Mean you, you, sorry, <laughs> that's just gonna mean you'll need even more alts because <laughs> you'll need to have the alts that can worship in different ways. So, what are you gonna say? I was I was just gonna say on the topic of sort of the the two I guess primary sects of Brog so far the one in Sky Pass which is like the main main one and was involved with uh, establishing the current calendar and sort of the current general structure of you know the peoples of the world so to speak the synod of elder congregations um, and then there's also obviously the uh, the Braga and Abbey of Crownstock. And, and I was sort of, I mean, it's not a perfect example, but I, I was thinking of it when I read this of um, uh, Protestant uh, Reformation and, you know, uh, sectarianism that sort of developed out of, um, out of sort of Martin Luther and, you know, that being the main example of, uh, you know, within relatively recent human history of um, a large scale um, and persisting um, division in interreligious uh within one religion, so to speak, you know, there's still Protestant and, and Catholic um, faiths being both Christianity still, instead of being, you know, sort of enough to be a new thing in this, in, you know, in the way one would say of Christianity, Christianity in relation to Judaism, for instance. Um, but yeah, I, it's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be so fun. Yeah, I, I think a mm -hmm. thing worth talk, bringing up kind of here too is that, you know, there was a, a thread talking a little bit about, you know, player, I think the question was brought up and the de developers answered on player-created religions, you know, how, you know, somebody can, you know, proselytize and, you know, make this a ton of propaganda and make something big enough that the, at least on, I think it was, they said black, well, like gold servers only, I believe, but yeah, on those servers, the the ability to be able to, you know, push something so far to where the storytelling guys are like, hey, you know, this can be useful for us, you know, we can make this, you know, a god, maybe not necessarily make an actual god for it, but make it to where there's tags for it, where NPCs can start picking up the religion, other things like that, so I thought that was a really cool thing, you know, even if you can't make your god real, you know, how, how real necessarily are the other gods, you know, th without believers, so it's really the believers kind of make the religion most of it's reality, you know, except, of course, when, you know, Cthulhu wants to come stomp on Crown's Rock and destroy it, wipe it from the earth. But that's another, that's another bit of reality that I don't think any of us want to see ever. Or maybe we do, but only in our deep, deep, twisted back subconscious. I mean, speak for yourself, I really want to see Cthulhu rise from the depths and stop on houses, just not mine, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but even more than that, making your own religion, I saw a thread uh, about, I wish I could remember the user who posted it, uh, but, you know, I just can't. But it was about, it was asking if a player could become a god, and how would that happen? And, it, you know, it seems very extreme, but if Revival is truly a sandbox game, and the world changes as we interact with it, perhaps that could even happen. So that's an interesting incentive uh, for a lot of people, I think, to start, I don't know, maybe it would start with a cult, then it would kind of turn into something else, and then the player would become ultra-powerful or die in some sort of heroic, fantastic way, and that would become a religion in its own right. Yeah, I mean, the cool thing is, I think what the devs' response 
has been is kind of like you know players are not going to actually um, gain control um, or uh, have powers that literally rival gods but there's nothing saying that powerful characters can't create a cult that you know and and gain a following of people that and characters that, that leave their gods um and that's just as fun to play around with as you know actually having the powers of god in some some extent From yeah, a I mean, I don't. Especially. Certainly, from a role playing perspective, and I would I mean, I would imagine that the devs wouldn't want to give players the Cthulhu house stomping abilities, for instance, because there's a lot of nefarious things, probably only nefarious things that can be done with that. Um, but I, I don't think it's out of question to think that, depending on the story, depending on the investment, players could have some ultra-powerful abilities. It's all relative in any case, right? If you're the most powerful player, you're still the most powerful player. <laughs> so, um. Yeah, so um, do we maybe want to move on to talking about the story for this week? Yeah, go for it. I think it's a good time to go into it with all the, uh, given all the interesting religious stuff we've talked about, I think there's a little bit of that in that one. And certainly some culture stuff. So, uh, Diggs, this was actually your suggestion, uh, but you didn't get to talk about that. So, do you want to talk about why you suggested it? I am all over the place and was not expecting that. Uh, you start and I'll jump in. <laughs> I was looking at okay. questions, actually. So. Yeah, I, uh, I got some facial cues, and maybe uh, <laughs> that was not the right place to start. <laughs> um, well, the story we read for this week was facts concerning the late Arthur German and his family. And uh, Dick suggested this because he felt there were some ties to culture. And as you guys know, we try to pick stories that tie in with the dev vlogs of the week. Um, and I guess I'll take it off a little bit, you know, the Germans are just your normal, everyday family. No, that's not the case at all. They are, most of them are mad, um, and they have deformities, and there's a lot of interesting historical background uh, that's included in the story. Uh, so does anyone want to take it from there? Yeah, I can jump in now. I, I, I just was on a different page, literally. Um, so, um, yeah, one of the things that I loved about the story was this sense of adventure. It's kind of hearkening back to Tarzan and it's kind of Indiana Jones, where um, you have the patriarch of the family, the great, great, great grandfather of uh, Arthur has traveled to the Congo um, and he's interacting with uh, the Africans there and... Um, uh, learning about their stories and developing African ethnology and um, and so that was kind of fun just to, to see that part of you know what uh, life might be like outside of a city life um, and then um, going through and exploring the cultural myths which that's I haven't even thought about that just even the in, in regards to revival just of the different mythologies that we might be um, listening to that might not even be real um, but uh, you know Lovecraft loves to play around with um, things that are worshipped um, that aren't quite human um, so that was a lot of fun it was fun to have a uh, uh, being that's worshipped that's not actually a, a alien <laughs> as far as we know um, so um, yeah th this uh, story if you haven't read it covers um, the history of this one family um, uh, several generations descended from an explorer um, all of them uh, have some physical deformities but most of them go mad for uh, various reasons, and uh, we find out at the end of the story why uh, the the um, 
we find out at the beginning of the story that the reason uh, this Arthur German goes mad is because of an object um, that he received um, and forced him to become so horrified that he killed himself, uh, set himself on fire, as a matter of fact, which is kind of bizarre. Um, and uh, what drove him to that is kind of the mystery of the story. Yeah, after reading this story and then now just recently, I was so busy last week, I didn't know that, or the a couple weeks ago, I didn't know that Diggs had suggested this story. So now it makes sense why you have want to have a world of alts and aging and dying and have certain NPCs <laughs> become part of your house to be the mad people that drive your new characters insane. But um, one thing I, I thought it was really interesting, uh, kind of towards the end, and, and spoilers, you know, you guys had a while to read this one, so... Uh, having that theme that I, I've noticed in a couple of the, the books I've read from Lovecraft so far that there's this theme of, you know, this person that's discovering this thing, they find out they, you know, it they may be genetically related to this, whatever it is. So I, that seems to be thematic in it. So uh, it's definitely a weird, weird thing that he kind of latches onto. I'm not sure how much um, Revival is planning to have any NPCs or something maybe tied into some cultic or you know some alien lineage uh it'll be interesting i don't know i'm sure ambo can chime in in the chat on um if how far they're planning to go in that because i know it seems like lovecraft really really did a lot of that kind of stuff with his his work so um but yeah i i i saw people mentioning in the chat you know getting reminded of the old 90s movie congo which i i figure had to have been some some bottom of the barrel writer that like had read this story before and is like let's just use this as inspiration and just kind of i mean the movie wasn't terrible terrible but i was like 10 years old when i saw it so it i had no idea but yeah i i think going back and watching it again it would be pretty atrocious <laughs> but i liked the story i liked uh i really liked the way that he used the lineage of the family to kind of build the story you know like he every he, t he said a little bit about every relative you know and it kind of led you on this path where and it didn't feel like you know a lot of sometimes you get writers that tell things you know and they tell story it didn't feel too much like you were being told uh you know about a bunch of backstory to set up something like the actual backstory was written in a way that it was the story and i really liked it i thought it was well done because i'm typically not a fan of too much writing in of backstory but i really liked the way it was done so i thought it was a cool cool read and a curve and a build up to you know what eventually happens in the end which i've kind of maybe already hinted too much but if you haven't read it you don't deserve to not be spoiled <laughs> Yeah, it's um, well because we've actually we've read one of these sort of um, lineage stories already, which was of course the Shadow of Arun Smith, um, in in which there's you know more of a, a deep one strain and whatnot. Um, it's actually it's interesting you mentioned uh, mentioned Congo and that uh, people have been talking about Congo and uh, in uh, the chat. There's actually another um, book which I recommend, completely unrelated to <laughs> to Revival, that uses a similar sort of um, lineage history technique um, for sort of progressing through things which is Poland by James Mishner um, which which is a really really well done um, sort of examination of Poland Polish history and, uh, and and sort of progressive culture but um, anyway just in case you need other things to read that aren't above draft you know take a break from the madness uh, <laughs> yeah yeah so I, I liked to the exploration of um, what this uh, ancestor could have been, um, because I'm I'm wondering is it is it really some form of ape? Is it some form of Neanderthal? I mean, how how far or because you know we're what ninety nine we have ninety nine percent of our genes in common with chimps, so. If you're getting something in between uh, a great ape and a human, you know, how much farther away from Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon could that be? Um, so I, I, I really wonder what, you know, exactly what this thing looked like. It seemed to have had more simian um, uh, arm and leg proportions, maybe. But, uh, 
Um, it was pretty cool to see how they how, how he was able to describe the deformities and give some hints that uh, the uh, um, the the ancestors that were in between Arthur and the original guy and Wade, I think. Um, how some of them are more uh, dexterous and have greater agility, and they have a fascination with circuses, it seems. <laughs> um, so uh, I just yeah. thought that. I, I mean, at the end, when uh, the, our main character sees. I'm going to give it away. I don't care. He yeah, sees. Yeah, yeah. He, I, he, I he, gets, he gets the, the, the princess. I'll call it the princess. And. Uh, realizes and it's this hideous thing it's partially gorilla but weirdly human um and lovecraft is writes you know I, I i would describe more except it's it's so terrible i don't want to talk about it and what i love is that if a lot of writers were to do that um we'd be like oh that's a cop out but but that's just like lovecraft's mo and he does it so well that it just makes it all the more horrifying that we can't fully picture it and, um, and and in terms of like what the what it actually looks like and how, the mystery behind it, I think uh, I think that has that. And we're talking. Sorry, I'm all over the place now. I get excited about stories. When we're talking about culture. Um, I think that's Lovecraft saying, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the Congo, which is you know." This dark place and stuff, and anything can happen there. There's mystery there, and you know there there's some problematic things about that. But uh, that seems to be Lovecraft's interpretation of culture. It's like either uh, um, like British society or society that makes sense and everything's orderly, uh, or some other continent that makes no sense, and there can be gorilla princesses. I thought it was funny how, you know, the family name, ger like German, just <laughs> like the Germans, that was not a popular uh, group of individuals around that time <laughs> in the world. So I always thought, I, I don't know if that was on purpose or just accidental, but it was it was interesting to me. It stood out. It actually didn't stand out to me until we started talking about it today. And, and Seth said the name, and I was like, wait, right. did she just say Germans? Because <laughs> right. I think I had pronounced it differently in my head when I was reading it. Me too. Uh, I, I had started um, reading the story out loud today, and that's when it hit me. When I read it, I didn't read it as German, but when I said it, I, I said it as German, and I was like, ah. And that's the whole um, fascinating part and kind of, uh, in some stories, it's really pronounced and difficult to read in the 21st century. Um, but all of the racial overtones there, that's kind of fascinating, which is why... I wish I could have a clearer picture of exactly what um, what Lovecraft envisioned the princess to look like, because his descriptions of other races are kind of sketchy anyway. <laughs> um, that I'm not. I I think that the princess could have looked quite human, like again closer to Neanderthal than to. Ape, but that would still be horrifying in his mind <laughs> just because of the way he describes other human people from different areas of the world so um, you know I, I, I think he would be almost as appalled but not maybe set himself on fire if he had just you know found out that an African <laughs> was his mother so <laughs> I think too one thing is you know at the time that Lovecraft was writing this particular book was kind of before a lot of things got you know steamrolling as far as evolution and uh, transitory you know stuff uh, transitory examples and stuff like that so you know that was probably a lot more of an interesting concept to people back then that most people it wasn't common knowledge you know I don't think so it's it definitely you know reading it back then probably had a whole nother level of meaning uh, than it does today so um, I just thought I'd throw that out there for people to chew on yeah, to think that it might be possible. Now, now, Diggs, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull an astral. I'm gonna play Dagan's advocate here. Um, I don't think, I don't think that the, um, I don't think there should be too much of a clear description on what, uh, what the princess looks like. And my, my, 
bad example for this is going to be Kafka. Um, so in, in considering the metamorphosis, now these are completely like way far apart, mind you, like in almost every respect, except for the fact that there's a description of a thing, right? But, but in, in considering the metamorphosis, right? Um, Kafka, for instance, was very adamant that you should never, ever, 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 ever draw the thing. Do not put it on the cover. If, you know, do not, do not do anything with it. It is only the words that are there and nothing more. And, um, and I, I think that in, in terms of Lovecraft, at least, while the effects and sort of the, the levels are different, you know, uh, Kafka being more sort of this weird surreal thing and not necessarily horror on the same immediate, well, not immediate, but it's, you know, it's not quite the same level of, of psychic, you know, mess that's supposed to be happening with the reader. Um, that for Lovecraft, at least, if you give it too much concreteness, then it can almost make it manageable, I think, in terms of, um, you know, what this thing actually is, right? Because, I mean, if you're if you're in the dark, right? I mean, assume, assume that you have a general fear of the dark. If you're in the dark and you see, like, you know, just, just you know, the side of a thing's face, right, in, in dim light and you only get a couple of ridges and, you know, mild features that, you know, reflect a glint or something, and... Uh, and you know you only see this much right and then your mind out of you know in fear and other things you know fills out you know much more of the rest and it probably makes it i think more terrifying than you know the slightly disfigured cat that you just saw walk by you know um so i mean that's sort of my thought is that if, if it goes too far if it becomes too clear then it then you can sort of deal with it and be like oh it's basically just a you know just a blank you know give or take a few features yeah, I mean, I I don't. I mean, I love the description of it. So I think the description of it, um, in terms of what was written, is great and fine. Um, just from my own perspective, I just wish that I. Um, what I find fascinating about it is that I can't tell um, if I can't tell if I should be horrified because it looks very close to a gorilla or that I should be horrified because it looks closer to human, actually, but Lovecraft is just so much of a racist <laughs> that even that closeness to humanity would still be horrific for him. So I, I'm just wondering on that kind of level, like like how close to human did he see it or how close to, to gorilla did he see it just because of some of his other stories where he describes people of other races and you're like, uh... Uh, we're all human. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I, I catch that. Yeah. One yeah. thing too. So I, I'm gonna. Oh, go for it. I was just gonna throw one last thing out there. One thing that's interesting about this book, in contrast to I think almost every other book we've read so far, is this one doesn't really have any direct relation to some super higher being. It's kind of more of this, you know, lower end. If there is some other, you know, deity or some cosmic entity linked to it, it's not, you know, it's not relevant at all. Like, I mean, it's not obvious at all so i think it's interesting because you know revival's going to have these you know huge being you know these otherworldly beings and stuff like that but it's also you know going to have some weird creatures and horrors and different things that maybe aren't tied to any specific deity so you know these they talk about these you know inhuman apes that were guarding it at the time you know and the tribe actually like killed those things off to take control of this area um that kind of can be maybe a hint of pe some things maybe I don't know the developers can chime in of things they're planning to do in revival for the creatures of the world you know maybe have some instances where you have these you know when you see something that doesn't look like a normal animal and something you know that area is like okay I better bring a lot of people with me I shouldn't be going here by myself so uh, just an interesting like last thought on that but go ahead Cess yeah I was so I'm going to add a, a last last question um and this is for you guys and also everyone that's watching on Twitch. Do we want to see mysterious creatures or horrifically detailed creatures in revival? I want to see I want to see a little bit of a mix. I like the idea of having, you know, it's a medieval world and I like the idea of having really relatable creatures and things in the world, but I like the idea of this kind of like with this book brought up having all of a sudden something that should be 
you know, normal for a certain biome is not quite normal, and just that fantastic element of it, you know, that low fantasy end kind of pulls into that mystery and, you know, eeriness, and it kind of adds that level of horror to it, because I think we, you know, there has to be some fantastical element to really give that horrific feel, so. You gave me chills. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, my answer was going to be yes. <laughs> so, both. I think we should see a, a spectrum. Um, because we also have, um, and I can't think of the name of the story off the top of my head, um, but there's one where this guy is, um, he's gone with the group exploring a cave, and he gets lost in the cave and separated from the group, and then he finds something is following him, and uh, it ends up being a devolved human. Um, so somebody had gotten stuck in the cave for, I don't know, decades or something and somehow actually devolved physically. And I think there's another story where that kind of happens too. Um, so running the gamut from uh, devolved humans to um, in-ape humans to, um, you know, alien mixed humans. I mean, it could be all kinds of stuff. Um, that would just be creepy for uh there's that sense of um uncanny valley which is what we are really getting um with this story like uh the the, the germans look the germans <laughs> the german family looked uh mostly human but just something was off but disturbingly so um i think we should see all of that to the ooh, stuff that drives us mad literally if uh, if you like that, Dix, there's a um, there's a, a manga artist by the name of uh, I think it's Junji Ito. Uh, is how to pronounce it. He's got a uh, um, a little uh, you know story called the Enigma of Amigara Fault. Um, I'll link it to you later. But if you want some fun, I think you can have some fun with that. Um, I okay. So my answer to your question, Sass, I want. Everything that we've already said, plus Pan's Labyrinth and two th and the 2000 movie The Cell, starring Jennifer Lopez. Um, like, I I don't know if everyone here has seen uh, Pan's Labyrinth, but like the the details in that movie, in the designs of some of these things, are fantastic, fantastic details. Like just. Uh, I don't like they're they're so they're so impressive that I don't even know what to think when I see them. Like I just see them and there's something that happens in my head completely below what I'm aware of and then I just get the output. Like it's it's interesting. And The Cell is by all means not a great movie, but there's some cinematography in there that makes it worthwhile. Um, so if somehow all of these things could could be uh, brought to coalesce, I would be like beyond ecstatic. Yeah. Very cool. I just really want Ombo to send a uh, demon hound to my doorstep. Uh, but uh, so I guess let's uh, switch gears and talk about some stuff happening in the community before we do a short intermission before our second hour. Uh, stuff that happened was the uh, game devastation podcast, which uh, Ombo was on with Stefan Frost. Um, I thought it was a really good conversation. What did you guys think? I liked it. It was uh, the the one thing that really stood out to me that I thought was a cool, you know, thing for for people that you know. If you the, a lot of our audience here, you know, is following the forums religiously and you know are absorb as as absorbed in this game as we are. Um, and I thought the big takeaway of this particular podcast for the people that are following the game is, you know, it was a chance for. Ambua, who's not necessarily the systems guy, to kind of give his angle of how some of these things, you know, related to lore and some of the other questions that were asked, you know, will work systematically because the person doing the interview, you know, didn't really have any idea about the game. So um, Ambua was kind of describing some systems and there were a lot of systems questions. So um, I think, you know, at, to date, I've heard I've heard a lot more from uh, Snipe Hunter about systems and it was really cool to get Ambua's take, you know, because you get another perspective of you know there's some more insight into kind of how they're accomplishing those things and you know maybe it's not I, I don't know maybe not everybody's into the 
mechanical stuff but like us us on theory forge here we're really into game design you know some of us have backgrounds in game design so uh i really love hearing that stuff you know hearing how the you know the parts are working internally uh to kind of get an idea of what the game is going to feel like you know what experience it's going to give the user so i thought that was a really cool element of it so i mean if you guys even if you've heard everything uh you should go hear that podcast and kind of listen for those types of things it's really really cool kind of stuff but that was my big takeaway from it yeah i just love seeing the devs out in the community talking about the game um and hopefully um dragging more people in um so um yeah it's just a lot of fun to get you know any little tidbits of information we can get is great Yeah, I, I also thought it was a great conversation. Um, I particularly liked hearing uh, Umbo's process for writing and how uh, they're going to approach it in the future because it seems like a large, scary task to be writing for a game that is sandbox and that the players are going to be able to manipulate because it's not only just, okay, are the mechanics going to get out of whack? I don't think they are, because I think these guys know what they're doing. Uh, but how is that going to fit in uh, with the fiction? Um, and so the idea that the way they're approaching it is kind of like a television series. Um, like this is these they have a layout of what they think is going to happen um, based on the observations uh, they're they have and just taking notes and then creating lore and it, this being this organic thing it's going to take a lot of foresight um, but hopefully it works out and we I'm sure we're going to get some really interesting stories uh, because not only uh, are the developers really committed but the players seem like they're really committed as well and want to do some interesting things in the world yeah I really like um, you know from the writing side of it it reminds me you know, for a game that we followed here on Theory Forge for the last like year and a half, really closely, um, EverQuest Next had this same issue where you know you're writing, you're creating a game where the world is supposed to change permanently based on what the players are choosing happen. So you can't really write a lot of you know future narrative. You know, and any narrative you write has to be somewhat modular in the in in the aspect that you can turn it on or it can be triggered by players or different things. And you don't want to waste too much writing time on things that aren't going to get used so it's kind of a tricky problem you know and I feel like revival the revival developer developers have been a lot more open in describing how they're doing this especially this podcast kind of gave some details into that uh, we didn't really get that kind of with EverQuest next you know we didn't know how they were going to be trying to achieve this you know yes players push things around but there is an overarching narrative and um, but I think you know both games have a similarity in the fact that uh, a lot of the head work right now is just creating a lot of backstory because you know if the goal is to give players the ability to kind of drive the story and create really immersive characters and push things around in your world you know they've got to have a lot to latch on to they've got to have something to ingrain themselves into from day one to where they can start pushing things you know if you have you know a week or two weeks it takes somebody to really get into their character before they start actually doing anything to the world you know, I don't think that's ideal. So having all this front end work and creating this really complex backstory, all these different creating these different organizations that are going to push and pull on each other with the players, you know, interacting and the NPCs being able to interact off the players. All this is like super important. And I like the fact that, you know, this is kind of, a, you know, this being the second game that I've seen doing this, I'm sure it's they're not the only two, but I feel like this is the next step in AI for an MMO experience. I feel like, you know, you have to, the worlds are just too stale. No matter how much content you create, no matter how well the game is made, you know, I feel like any world nowadays, you know, jumping into just feels really stale compared to, you know, you, you, you're not able to change anything permanently. You're not able to affect anything really. And I think that's this next thing. And I think there's a huge audience for it. That's why I think, you know, EverQuest Next and its troubles will still find some amount of success if it's put out. Uh, I feel like Revival has a real big chance to be successful because kind of the method they're choosing to deploy so I'm really definitely interested in you know 
how this rising and I never thought until the podcast about you know that episodic type thing but um, if anybody's aware of Telltale Games uh, company that do like Game of Thrones uh, I think they do they're starting at one with Minecraft or something too like they're actually doing this episodic type game content and a lot of people really are enjoying that they have The Walking Dead too I mean I should have said that one first that's a huge one too um, so this episodic game content people are already doing this you know I think that that's why something you know combining this idea of the sandbox and then this episodic overarching narrative is just a really attractive thing that can be really successful if it's done well and I think these guys are off to a great start so it was a cool podcast to listen to for sure but I think we are we're kinda of getting close to our we're gonna take a little short intermission here just because we're gonna be breaking this up on YouTube so um, I kind of want to roll. Does any first of all, does anybody have anything else they want to say about the podcast? Uh, I mean, I'll say real quick. The one um, there was one thing right at the end, actually, the very last question that Frost asked um, about how uh, Omblis team works with the art guys, the, desi- the level designers and stuff. Um, and and so uh, Frost had asked about basically what the process was there. Um, because he he had sort of witnessed experience with this on on his work with Wildstar, um, which you know has a lot of interplay between their their writing and their design. So um, basically, I mean, in, in some, uh, it's a very you know very uh, involved uh, back and forth process. But like um, just looking at so far what the houses look like, right from the 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 two um, housing streams that we had with. Uh, um, you know, on the, on the two Thursdays past, like, I think that <laughs> that process is working out so far. I don't know about you guys, but I was completely blown away by what I saw. Like, it just felt good, you know? It didn't just look good, it wasn't just pretty, but it felt like good space, and, you know, the color on the walls was, like, mind-blowing. It was just good, and the shine on stuff. I, mean, I like it. I like it so far. So I, I think their process is really good for that. Um, but the rest of the po- the podcast had all sorts of great things in it, so uh, everyone should listen to it if you uh, if you have a chance. Um, yeah, I think it ran about fifty minutes ish long, close to fifty minutes. So, but it was all really good stuff. Yeah. So definitely check it out. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and roll us into a quick intermission. So you guys, if you want to use the bathroom really quick or anything like that, you'll have a few minutes. Um, I will give you a little bit of a warning in Twitch chat before we're going to start up, and you guys should hear it. So um, we will see you guys in a few minutes, and thanks for watching the first episode. And we have another hour, awesome hour, coming up next. So we will see you guys in a minute.